questions, so I'm going to try to break a personal record in how fast I can go through these slides. So type hints. Uh, the last time I talked about this subject a few months ago, it was a PEP that was a proposal. Now it's being accepted, so that's good news. But I still want to start with really ancient history. Uh, in 2000, 15 years ago, there was a type sig that was already discussing some way of adding type hints or static, at, a, at the time we called it optional static typing to Python as, as a completely optional way to sort of communicate either between developers or between the developer and the compiler about the types of arguments uh, of functions. And we actually sort of, one of the proposals which I at the time already favored uh, looks exactly like the annotation proposal that eventually got accepted. Uh, but at the time, it was too controversial. Uh, I picked it up again in 2004, 2005, did a series of, again, incredibly controversial blog posts that sort of, the sky was falling, people hated it, but at the same time, my own thinking about the top check sort of slowly continued, and I started introducing things like generic functions and generic types. Uh, not too much, not too long after that, I realized that the, the whole topic of defining types for arguments uh, was too controversial to actually introduce in Python 3 as such. But as a compromise, uh, we got PEP 3107, which was accepted, uh, which introduced the function annotation syntax with little or no semantics. The annotations would be introspectable, but otherwise they would be entirely ignored. And this was very much a compromise approach uh, intended so that eventually experiments could be carried out like what has happened more recently. Because the recent history is that a few years ago at PyCon in Santa Clara, uh, I met um, enterprising young student who was writing, he, at the time he was writing, I think, a dialect of Python that uh, he wanted to uh, have gradual typing. Uh, and I convinced him that if he created the dialect of Python, uh, his language would be great and it would have one user. Uh, on the other hand, I said, if you if you actually tweak your syntax and add some compromises and, and sort of mess around a little bit so that it fits in with the existing PEP 3107 syntax, then maybe your work will not just be to earn you a, a doctorate, but will also be useful for the Python community. And he actually took that to heart and uh, started uh, experimenting with notations like list square brackets of t. Uh, I also ended up working with him at Dropbox. However, uh, my pie still didn't seem to be going anywhere until last summer at EuroPython, Bob Ippolito gave a talk what Python can learn from Haskell. And he had like three very specific proposals, two of which to me seemed completely inactionable and the third one of which was, we should adopt my part. Uh, so that sort of inspired me uh, and a few other people, including Lucas Langa, who drafted the first version of a PEP for type hints. And this, again, was an incredibly controversial, explosive discussion on Python ideas and afterwards on Python dev and on IRC and everywhere else where I didn't want to look. But finally, sort of in, in my head at least, it began to gel what this was good for and I met uh, someone who had been thinking about this kind of stuff for a while, uh, Jeremy Seek, who uh, I'll be mentioning a little later. So 
The architecture that we eventually agreed on, and I think MyPy was very instrumental here, static type checking is not a function of the Python interpreter. And this is the sort of, the, the sort of big light bulb that went on in my head and in other people's head. Uh, even, you, for, even for Yuka, it took, took a while for this to sort of gel. The, the first version of MyPy that supported Python would actually just run your program, and just before running it, it would type check it. And then he added a command line option to only type check it. <laughs> And then eventually we removed the command line and removed the option to actually run the code. We said to run it, you use the C Python interpreter or MyPy or whatever, uh, my, no, PyPy or whatever. On the other hand, if you want your code to be type checked, that's a separate thing. Just like PyLint is a separate thing. It doesn't slow you down at execution time at all. Uh, and this architecture suddenly a lot of things started making sense, and this helped sort of decide how to, how, to, how to design all little details of the static language. Uh, the second part of the architecture is sort of obvious. We're using function annotations uh, for these type hints. Uh, you put them in your code, only the type checker cares about them. Uh, the third thing that was really important that was sort of also a somewhat smaller light bulb is you have to have another way of placing type hints separately so that the type hints are separated from the code that they annotate. Uh, we call these stub files. You could think of them as header files, but they're not really the same thing because they're not actually ever used at, uh, at execution time. They're only used by the type checker. Uh, before I go into more detail about all these things, why do you actually want a static type, type checker? And this sort of, there have been many reasons why people have proposed uh, optional static typing for Python, and some of those reasons were very runtime oriented. People were hoping that at runtime they could catch functions being called with the wrong argument, or people have hoped that at runtime a just-in-time compiler could generate better code, or maybe sort of at module import time type, check, type annotations could be used to generate uh, more efficient code. This is an idea that, for example, Cython actually uses, uh, albeit with a different, slightly different notation. However, the real reason why static typing is an important thing is that it is not that it makes your code run faster, because that's an incredibly complicated uh, thing. It is that it helps you find bugs sooner. And the larger your project, the more you need things like this. And in fact, people who have really large old code bases maintained by dozens or hundreds of, or thousands of engineers are already within their organization running various things that are in some sense static type checkers. Uh, there is an additional thing that especially inline type hints help you help when you have a large team working on a large code base, which is that new engineers are really helped by seeing the type hints, and it helps them understand the code. Uh, and it's, it's sort of, it, it's in part, it's just a communication mechanism from programmer to programmer, which in general is always one of the criteria I use for designing parts of Python. Uh, let's see. So the type hints in particular help a, a type checker. Python is such an incredibly dynamic language. There are so many clever hacks where you introspect a dictionary or a module or a class or you use a dynamic attribute getter that very quickly, if you do traditional sort of program ex symbolic execution of a program, trying to figure out what the types of an argument are uh, so that you can then check that that argument is used consistently with the argument type. Well, you can't even find where the call sites are <laughs> because 
everything is dynamic and there might be four different functions named keys and you, don't act, you can't actually tell which one is being called very easily. Type hints help a static type checker sort of get over those humps. There's a little statistic that the authors of PyCharm uh, told me. They, PyCharm is an IDE that uh, has its own sort of partial type inferencing for Python programs so that they can show you not just when you're making syntax errors but also when you're calling things that don't exist or with the wrong number of arguments and it can make decent suggestions about what methods started, starting with K might occur at a particular point. So they told me that they can correctly infer the type of maybe 50 or 60 percent of all expressions in a pro Python program, which means that almost half the time they don't know the type of an expression, which makes it impossible for them to then give any useful hints or do any checking. In the case of, I, of, of an IDE, of course, what they have to do in that case is be silent or use some other fallback heuristic to give suggestions, not say your program is wrong. Uh, but nevertheless, if there were type hints in a program, they could often uh, produce more accurate predictions and so on. Uh, I did mention the additional documentation. Often you find coding conventions at companies that say in the doc string every argument must be described and the type of every argument must be indicated. Well, if the type of the argument is already part of the syntax, you save a little space in the doc string. Also, if you don't have a doc string at all, a document generator can still use the annotations to generate better documentation. Uh, so why do we need these stub files? Why do we need to be able to put the annotations elsewhere? Well, the, the first use case that you think of very quickly is C extensions. When you start thinking about static typing anything in Python, you realize that there is a huge number of built-in functions and built-in modules for which you also need to have type information. And you can't sort of easily derive, you can't easily scan the C code and then figure out what the types of all those functions and classes are. So you need to have some dummy Python code that declares the types for, for your corresponding built-ins and uh, built-in modules. So this is the first use case for stub files. The second use case, and sort of there's a series of use cases that have to do with Python code that you might want to annotate, but there are reasons not to put the annotation in the code. And so it could be that this is just third-party code, and you, you can stick annotations in third-party code, but now you have made a local mod, and every time you upgrade that third-party package, you have to do that again, or that's a lot of work. You can't always push uh, those changes to the third party because they might not care, there might not be a maintainer, you might be using an old release that doesn't get maintained anymore, maybe they want to be source compatible with Python 2 and the, you, you, the annotation syntax only exists in Python 3, and so on and so forth. There's also, there are too many things to, to sort of try and annotate everything. Uh, so stub files are a lighter weight approach to annotating code that for some reason you don't want to annotate in place. So when I present all these ideas, I still get a lot of very sort of critical negative looks. A lot of people really like the fact that Python is dynamic and they don't see any reason why they would pollute their code with stuff that in their mind is associated with troglodyte languages like Java or C++. <coughs> well, and nevertheless, the people who are maintaining very large code bases often have some form of static analysis. They have things that look in the doc strings and use some convention for storing types in doc strings uh, 
uh, and use that in their analysis. Uh, or they have some kind of static analysis, but they don't have they don't have annotations at all, not in doc strings nor anywhere else, and their type checker just isn't very effective. PyLint can only catch so much. Uh, so, in some sense, what this pr whole proposal is actually introducing is more or less just a standard notation that you can use in case you already want this. It's very much optional. Uh, in Python 3.5, the first version where it's available, it's also provisional, which is a technical term for new standard library modules and new PEPs in general, where we say, well, we introduced this in the standard library, but we're reserving the right to sort of change the API for one full Python release. So in Python 3.6, the typing module may look a little different, perhaps until it's unlikely, but it could even look quite different than it looks in, in 3.5. And this is something that sort of falls outside the normal guarantees of backwards compatibility. You can read up on this in PEP 4.11, which sort of explains and defines the concept. Uh, the key thing is that in 3.5, nobody's code will break. And my plan is that beyond that, we won't break your code either. But at the same time, I do want to sort of take a position. I don't want to say, well, we have the annotation syntax without semantics, let people just do whatever they want to do. They can use MyPy if they want to. They can use their own doc string based convention. They can put type annotations in decorators. Let, let a billion flowers bloom. I think that we've had enough experiments and sort of attempts at doing this that it's better to get everyone behind one proposal. And I was very pleased to see that Google and PyCharm, for example, were both very supportive of this proposal, even though they're not planning to adopt MyPy itself. But they are planning to adopt this new, new syntax. Uh, some people said, well, OK, maybe you're right. Maybe we need a uh, syntax. But you can't sort of force it down our throat. It's, it's, it's unripe, immature, needs to be thought about more, let's wait until 3.6, but really that's not going to help anybody. Uh, if you want a notation that uses angular brackets instead of square brackets, introducing that is just as hard in 3.6 as it's going to be in 3.5. So I sort of I mean, I, I started this with what I thought was plenty of lead time. We had a large number of very productive discussion threads, uh, and I just pushed on everything to, to sort of reach a compromise and uh, get something working. And so if you were hoping to use this for code generation, or if you still believe that type annotations mostly are useful to make your code faster. Sorry, that's not actually very high on my list of use cases. Uh, PyPy is doing fine without type hints. We'll see what Cython says. Cython, I believe, can already optionally use uh, annotation syntax instead of the traditional Cython uh, notation. Maybe they'll prove me wrong, but CPython certainly is not going to suddenly run your code faster if you put annotations in, and that is not at all part of the plan. So there's one more thing. PEP 3107 is now, hmm, it's not quite 10 years old. Maybe it's eight years old. There are definitely people who have used annotations creatively and done something completely different with them. Uh, 
Here's an example of something. I, I made this up, but I saw something similar where someone had written little, little language for marking up functions that would be invocable from some command line uh, where the annotations specified, say, the option uh, name used. That's cute. Uh, that's not going to break in Python 3.5. However, if you, if you run code like that with MyPy in order to type check it, MyPy is going to choke on that particular notation because MyPy expects the annotations to be something else. Of course, you may not need to run MyPy. Uh, you may not care at all. Uh, or if other parts of your code you actually do want to benefit from type checks uh, and you, you, you say, think you want to run MyPy but you still want to use this particular notation in some part of your code, there's actually a decorator defined in the, in the pep that uh, you can use to shut it up. And it basically tells MyPy this function, or you can also use it as a class decorator, this class uh, ignore the annotations because they mean some, they're meant for someone else. Okay, so that was mostly an apology, a history, sort of the, the sort of the motivational part of the talk. Now I'm going to try and outline a bit how this actually works. How do you think about type hints? Uh, if you really want to know, you should probably start with Pet 483, which is sort of a simplified theory behind this stuff. Uh, but let me go over a few of the basics. Uh, here's a very simple function named greeting. It has an argument with a type and it returns a type. It happens to be both our strings. Uh, then there's a function greet that calls the function greeting. Greet does not use annotations. Greet is not type checked. Uh, the basic idea of gradual typing is that both functions can occur in the same program, even in the same module. And uh, a type checker is required to accept that code. If inside the greeting function there was some use of uh, the name argument in a, in a way that is incompatible with it being a string, a type checker will complain. However, in the greet function where there are no annotations to be seen, uh, if you invoke greeting, it, it's not going to, perhaps the, the biggest thing to, to sort of understand is if I could only get a mouse. Okay, well, you can see def greet of name. Clearly name could be anything. Print greeting of name. The greeting function only accepts a string. Uh, however, we're not going to get complaints from the type checker that we don't know for sure that name is a string in this greet function. And that is sort of that in case of doubt, don't complain. That is one of the basics of gradual typing. And that's, that's sort of different from for example, in, if we were to assume that name, given that it has no annotation, has the type object, then we would actually have a type violation in this code. Because greeting doesn't take all objects. An object could be a list, and a list is definitely not acceptable uh, for greeting. At least it's not a string. So instead of being sort of picky, a a good type checker using type hints sort of checks, thoroughly checks code that has annotations and backs away from code that doesn't and lets the two be combined in a useful way. Also, if the annotated code calls something that is unannotated, it will always uh, just assume that uh, the best possible thing will happen there. So this is sort of the principle I think I'm repeating myself here, which is unfortunate, because that means less time for, for questions. Uh, code without annotations is always okay to the type checker. Uh, 
there are some hand wavy things here because there are some subtle, subtle differences, but basically there is this magical type named any, which is different from the also somewhat magical type named object. Uh, and the absence of annotations in first approximation can be seen as annotate everything with the type any. And any has uh, a bunch of magic properties, and I'll get to that here. So any is confusingly both at the top and the bottom of the class hierarchy, or the ty type hierarchy, really. Uh, on the one hand, if you ask for any object x, is it an instance of any? And this, this is, of course, a, a question that the type checker asks itself. It's not the question that you ask at runtime, although I use a, a runtime notation here to express it. Uh, it's always true. Everything is an instance of any. Also, everything that's a class is a subclass of any, which really means it's a subtype. Uh, apologies to Mark. Uh, on the other hand, and, and this is the weird, weird part, any is also a subclass of every other class. Uh, and I'm going, this is, you can see I, I should not try to draw squirrels, but I can draw a very simple diagram with boxes and lines <coughs> with the help of, help of PowerPoint. This is a very simple class hierarchy. It has object, which is the built-in object. It has number and sequence, which happen to be abstract cl base classes. It has none type, which is the type of the variable none. Uh, now let's add any. So any is sort of a superclass of object. It's even higher up in the type hierarchy, but it's also at the very bottom. And if you were to think of this in terms of a classic subclass relationship, everything becomes a mess. Because now you can prove that Every class in this hierarchy is a subclass of every other class in this hierarchy, which completely collapses everything to a big muddy ball of everything. So we don't want that. We want this version. And there is a separate relationship which is formally called, uh, is consistent with that is just like the subclass relationship, but special cases any on either the T1 or the T2 position. And you either got this at this point, or I'm going to ask you to uh, look it up later. Actually, Jeremy Seek has a very good uh, blog post. What is gradual typing? So what do we have in our typing module? Uh, typing.py, it's a single pure Python module. It's the only thing that the PEP actually adds to the standard library. Uh, very easy to ignore. Uh, this is where you import things like any. Uh, so again, there's no new syntax. Syntactically, we are constrained by the stuff that Python 3.4 or 3.2 even can already do. Uh, and with a little clever operator overloading, that's actually uh, not such a terrible constraint. Uh, we're not actually adding any type annotations to other parts of the standard library. So if you're looking for examples of type hints, you'll, you're going to have to look elsewhere. Uh, also, this typing.py itself uh, can also be installed in Python 3.2 or 3.3 or 3.4 using pip install. Uh, what does the typing.py module do? It defines a whole bunch of magic objects like any and union and dict and list with capital D and L uh, that are used for uh, expressing types. So here is a little example class, it's kind of messy. There's a chart class and it has a function set label. Uh, 
and you can see that it's being annotated with uh, some argument types. I don't give the function bodies. Now, there are also some uh, plain functions. Make label and get labels are not part of the class. They're plain functions. And I just include them to show that you can uh, use a class as a type annotation in s some other part of, the, of your code. Uh, I'm also showing here that you can use the built-in list type as the type at the bottom you have the variable, the argument points, which is a list, and the function get labels returns list. However, that is incomplete information. Uh, because we would like to be able to express, to tell the type checker ab about these lists, what, are, what is the type of the element of these lists? And so there is a new notation using a capital list and a capital tuple, uh, which are just some more magic classes that you can import from the typing module. Uh, and now we can say, well, let's look at the return type first. The return type is list of string. So that is written as capital list, square bracket, stir, square bracket, close. You can also combine more complicated uh, types. We can have a tuple of a float and a float, which is a tuple of length two, each of which item has type float. Uh, and you can use that as the argument of a list type. So now we know exactly what the type of that points argument is, and we know exactly what the return value is. Uh, you can go one step further. Instead of list, you can write ABCs. Uh, the typing module exports modified versions of the standard collection ABCs like iterable, and you can actually say the argument can be any iterable of tuples of float and float. However, we still keep the return type. This is pretty idiomatic uh, type hinting. The return type is a concrete list because we actually sort of declare that it returns a list and not some other sequence. So what exactly happened there? Typing.iterable is almost just an alias for collections.abc.iterable. However, it has a little bit of magic behavior uh, added to it, but it is still usable as a standard ABC. It, it's, it's usable in all the contexts where collections.abc.iterable is usable, but it is also uh, uh, a type. Uh, the typing.list type shadows the built-in lowercase list, uh, and tuple has some resemblan resemblance to the built-in tuple, however, it's not an immutable sequence, it's more like a structure. Uh, I have been incredibly imprecise in my terminology. Technically, we should talk about types when we talk about things that the type checker cares about, and classes when we talk about things that happen at runtime. Uh, the reason that most of the time things work out fine if you're fuzzy about the distinction is that all classes are usable as types. When you define a class, that class is always also usable as a type. Uh, however, there are a few magic things that are considered types, like any and union, uh, that aren't classes. So, in the very little time I've got left, uh, if we want to have any Q&A. Uh, a complete enumeration of things that can be used as type hints. Uh, so, Anything that's a class can be used as a type hint. There are these generic types, list of int. Uh, there are the magic things that I haven't all explained yet, although I've given enough of an explanation of any. Uh, you can also define your own generic types. Uh, the first thing that I haven't mentioned yet, with which is pr pretty standard in uh, type theory, is a union type. You could easily have a function that takes either strings or numbers as argument. Uh, and you might use a union like that. A very common special case of unions is 
an argument that is either a certain type or it's none, and we can express that using optional. Optional doesn't necessarily save you any characters to type, but it certainly gives a very clear intention to the human reader. The type checker actually just expands it to union of int and none. So tuple, I already sort of tried to explain how tuple works. It really is a structure with a fixed number of fields, each with their given uh, type. Uh, it's sometimes called a Cartesian product if you read uh, academic papers. For those people who use tuples as immutable sequences, you can say a tuple of some type and then dot, 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 three literal dots, ellipsis. Uh, that's actually a mutable sequence of floats of arbitrary length. Uh, callable, sometimes you want to say an argument is a function that takes such and such arguments. Uh, we have a notation for that. It's not a very elegant notation, but given all our constraints, it's the best we can do. If you have a really complicated argument signature, you can just put an ellipsis there and then it will take anything and then at least you can at least, you can still talk about the return type. Uh, generic classes, uh, I'm gonna cut this short, but you define these by deriving from a special thing named generic uh, using a type variable uh, type variables have to be defined explicitly using the type var uh, helper function. Uh, the collection ABCs like sequence themselves are all generic and can be used in this way automatically. Uh, you could also define generic functions. Again, you introduce a type variable. Type variables can be used, like you can use, if you only ever need one type variable in a particular module, you can just use T everywhere. You don't have to define a new type variable for each function. Uh, this is something I'm going to skip in favor of more question time. Uh, there is a built-in type variable that can express something that is either a string or a bytes, which is a very important idea in Python 3, mostly for Python 2 backwards compatibility, but there we have it. Uh, oh yeah, now we get into the sort of slightly ugly stuff. Uh, sometimes you have to have an annotation that contains a forward reference. It needs to, it, there's an argument, but the class that is used as the argument type hasn't been defined yet, and sort of one common example is uh, recursive types. You can put the whole annotation in string quotes and then the type checker will understand, will sort of evaluate that uh, while C Python just sees it as a string. Uh, there are also some cases where you want to annotate variables, especially class variables, uh, that are used as instance variable defaults. It's, this is very useful. Uh, we have a type comment for that, and there's also a cast function. If you somehow need to tell the type checker, everything's okay, don't worry, little guy. So stub files have a PYI extension. Uh, the bodies in the stub file contain literal, uh, literally three dots. Uh, in stub files, you can define overloading, which is also something I'm going to uh, skip explaining. You can disable your type checks in probably too many different ways, but this is to sort of make the people who don't like type hints or have other uses uh, for the annotations function as happy as possible. And then finally, here's a list of alternative syntaxes that uh, have been proposed at various times for, and what we ended up on the left. Uh, I'll actually skip this. Uh, I do notice that uh, nobody actually proposed a uh, return type paren uh, arguments <laughs> for a callable. Uh, the reason that we ended up with the somewhat clunky syntax that's actually in the PEP is that it needs to be easy to parse. We don't want to introduce any new syntax uh, because we want to be able to backport 
uh, typing.py to previous uh, Python versions, at least 3.2 and up. And we really don't want to have to change other standard library modules. So if you're a type theoretical academic, you're probably very unhappy with this proposal, but uh, we can iterate over the next few years, and at least we have the first iteration in our hands rather than in the air. Uh, the PEP has been accepted. Thank you, Mark Shannon, again. Uh, the status is provisional. The code is in 3.5 beta 1. And I'm very happy that uh, much of the di discussion is behind me. So let's start some more discussion. So we don't really have time for questions, but we can make time for questions. Um, if the next speaker can come up on the stage um, now. Thank you. So first question. Thanks. Uh, I really like the idea of uh, type hints. I, I'm sure that will, will, uh, will help us write better or uh, more high quality code, but I'm not so sure. Uh, I like the idea of having two options for uh, specifying these type hints, so in a stub file or inside the source code itself. That somehow doesn't seem very Pythonic that there's two options to do one thing. Um, and I'm thinking, I've also heard some comments from other people that say uh, uh, argument lists will become very long, uh, so the code will become harder to read. Um, would you perhaps uh, recommend you always using stub files, as I can see that uh, IDEs could perhaps uh, inline these uh, in, in the source file as you're working on it? Um, can I ask you to wait for the question to be finished if you want to leave and uh, so we can hear the answers? That was a long question. Uh, my position is that there are really quite a few downsides to stop files. Uh, it's, it's sort of difficult to switch back and forth between the stub and the main code. And so when you're reading the code, you, on the one hand, the argument lists become longer, but if you put all the annotations in the doc string, your doc string becomes longer, and people are okay with that. Uh, in many cases, the annotations aren't actually so, so verbose. Some of the examples I gave, for example, would, are, are impractical. The, in practice, you would always use a type alias, which I forgot to mention. You can just say A is, a is some type expression, and then after that, A is usable as a type alias. And so using type aliases, you can uh, make your annotation shorter and also more meaningful. Uh, so I think that the, the case for inline annotations is still pretty strong. At the same time, there are absolutely cases where stubs are the only acceptable solution. So we, I, I think that we have to have both. Over here. I'm raising my hand. Um, hi. Sorry, where's the speaker? Ah, yeah. You mean? So um, to add what I'm, I don't know what the proper term would be, but they're effectively arguments to things like list or uh, callable. You're parameters. Using, sorry? The parameters. 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 Um, in Python, we use parentheses to specify parameters to things. Um, why did we make square brackets for these instead? Because usually the thing before the square bracket is a class, and calling a class has already the meaning of instantiating uh, the class to an instance. Also, the, the square brackets sort of make you wonder, whoa, what's going on here? Something interesting must be going on, and uh, sort of parameterizing types are something quite different than calling a function or instantiating a class. So sort of the square brackets came out because they're notationally sort of, they stand out a little bit, 
and yet they are actually already part of existing Python syntax because you can just use, we, we actually implement the square brackets by overloading get item on the, on the meta class. And that will be the last question of AI. Sorry. Uh, I have two questions actually. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the first question would be uh, <clears throat> Is there any way to express variance and contravariance? Yes. Uh, Great. I didn't That's get to this, but it is in the PEP. You can have variant and uh, invariant, covariant, and convariant type, contravariant cool. type variables. Nice. The default is invariant. Uh, second quick question, uh, how do numeric uh, types work, like floats, ints, can I pass an int to a float, or...? That is currently done by a little bit of uh, special casing in the type checker, so that if the specification says float and the actual value is int, that's actually considered a subtype and acceptable. Well, um, thank you again, Guido. My pleasure. My apologies. <laughs>